Hello and good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again, where thanks to the very kind, very good people who support me on Patreon, people like Joseph Darlington, I have the opportunity to talk about a film that has been long requested for this channel, and one that I'm really excited to actually have an excuse to talk about, finally. Kingsman The Secret Service. You can't put the words Secret Service in your title and not have it attract the attention of Bond fans everywhere. Kingsman is an action comedy espionage film concerning an unpolished young ruffian's recruitment into a spy organization, going through trials and mentorship by a seasoned veteran to eventually do battle with an over-the-top villain who has a dastardly scheme that will cause the deaths of millions around the globe. That's the top line setup, and I'll go more into the details of the plot later on, but I want to just start this off by saying that when this film was first released in 2015, it was such a breath of fresh air for someone like me who was really craving some good, classic, campy spy adventure movie fun. It was very well publicised at the time that the M.O. of Kingsman was to return to something of the fun, irreverent tone of spy movies past. The Roger Moore era uh, particularly springs to mind here with its outlandish gadgets and fantastical villains plots, and on the surface, Kingsman is something of a return to form for the genre, and it knows it. Uh, characters call it out in dialogue. Give me a far-fetched theatrical plot any day. <laughs> the old Bond movies. Oh, man. And indeed, the film carries something of a self-referential tone throughout. I'd like to think of it as something to kind of like what the movie Scream was to horror movies, but this to spy movies, of course. It has a lot of fun calling out the tropes and subverting expectations of the genre while still doing the genre and making a very engaging story with real stakes and characters you care about. So this is not to say that I dislike the tone of the Daniel Craig era Bond films, uh, of course. I mean, they're doing something different than what was done before, and I think a couple of the Craig Bond films are amongst the very best the series has to offer, but I love the tone and light-hearted energy of some of those earlier, perhaps goofier, Bond films, and Kingsman was trying to make that viable again, but updated for a modern audience, and I think it achieves that so, so well. On the surface, at least, but we'll get to that later on. A big part of the success of the movie for me are the villains. Samuel L. Jackson plays the main baddie, tech entrepreneur Richmond Valentine, who's kind of like Mark Zuckerberg meets Steve Jobs kind of figure, and he's so, so great. He's funny, he's cool, he's crazy, he's not really presented as a physically threatening figure, but he doesn't need to be in that classic Bond villain mold. I mean, he has all the, the tech and the people around him. There's a nice running gag that he can't stand seeing the sight of blood, which is such a hilarious little quirk, and especially when his entire scheme revolves around getting members of the general public to murder one another. If he did? That tends to happen when you shoot someone in the head. It feels good, right? No, no, it does not feel good. It feels fucking awful. What? Beside him is Henchwoman Gazelle, played by Sofia Boutella, who is just one of the very best things in the film. She has these incredibly sharp, like, swords as prosthetic legs, and feels like a real hearkening back to Bond villains like Teehee and Jaws, who had some kind of deadly physical feature, and she is given several opportunities to showcase her skills throughout the movie. Ah, she's just phenomenal. Her and Sam Jackson make a wonderful pair, and they are my absolute favourite things in this film. Why is it that my favourite things in these Bond spoofs are always the villains? That's not to say the heroes aren't fun in their own right, of course. I mean, Colin Firth is one of the very best working British actors right now, and it's exciting to see him in such an action-y role. Uh, he's mainly known for dramas and comedies, so it's fun to see him here as a gentleman spy, a member of The Kingsman, an organisation led by Michael Caine, and in the film's prelude, we see Colin Firth's trainee killed in a botched mission. Firth feels guilty, so he seeks out the trainee's widow and young son and gives the son a special medallion with a phone number on it, which is basically a get-out-of-jail-free card, which is what it's literally used for, as our young protagonist, played by Taron Egerton, is a rough, scally lad who is frequently in trouble with the authorities. This gets him in prison, and that leads to him calling the number, which gets Colin Firth out, and then eventually gets him tangled up in a world of espionage and spies, just like his father before him. But just to talk about Taron Egerton for a bit, I love this actor. I think he is such a great star, and Kingsman was really his first major starring vehicle, and despite that, he, I still feel really bad for him that he doesn't get to have his name on the poster, but uh, whatever. He plays the scally side of this character so well, and has a confidence and a swagger that is refined and fine-tuned as he becomes a Kingsman and a gentleman, I mean, my fair lady style, as the film calls out in dialogue, but he doesn't change the way he speaks, he doesn't lose his accent, which I really like. 
While we're talking about the cast, there's really no one here to dislike. I mean, Mark Strong plays Merlin, who's a sort of quartermaster character, but is very much involved in the mission and is more badass than any Q we've previously seen. And Michael Caine, as I mentioned before, plays the head of the Kingsman, and he's his usual awesome self. I know from watching some of the behind the scenes stuff that Michael Caine was cast in this role because he'd already been in a previous Matthew Vaughn produced film at Harry Brown and Lord knows I'm never going to complain about Michael Caine's presence in any film. I think the man is just, he elevates everything he's in to something that is, even, even when he's in a terrible film like Jaws the Revenge, he makes it watchable. That being said, I would have loved it if this role was played by a former Bond. I think Roger Moore would have fit into this role so perfectly. Mark Hamill pops up for a little cameo, and I, mean, I suppose he was just in London when they were filming Star Wars, but I love seeing him all the same. So having a lot of love for the cast and the crew and just the film in general, I mean, I've, I think this is like the fifth or sixth time I've seen the film, and all previous times have been like with friends, with some booze, and just enjoy the ride, enjoy the adventure, enjoy the romp. For this review, I kind of looked at the film with a different set of glasses on, I think. Perhaps a bit more analytical and a bit more critical, and looking at it that way kind of exposed some things about the film that I'm not entirely sure about, or perhaps even didn't like that much. But before I get into that, I do just want to say that this is a fun, exciting movie, and it's really recommended to every spy fan out there. It's just a fun romp. That being said, indulge me for a moment, please. The film has some mixed messages and themes surrounding class. Now, I'm British, so of course the class system is embedded into every fibre of my being, but for those who don't know how the British class system works, it's something like this. I look down on him because I am upper class. I look up to him because he is upper class. But I look down on him because he is lower class. <laughs> I am middle class. I know my place. <laughs> I look up to them both. But I don't look up to him as much as I look up to him. Because <laughs> he has got innate breeding. I have got innate breeding, but I have not got any money. Kingsman feels like it's very much trying to say something about class, but I don't really know what that is. So, I mean, obviously we have uh, Taron Egerton's Eggsy, very much a working class chav with a heart of gold, who is shown the ropes of a very upper class society of gentlemen and ends up bridging the gap, not by becoming middle class, but by taking on attributes of both ends of the system. There isn't really a representation of middle class in this film, uh, that we get to know very well at least. It's very much opposite ends and then the distinction between the old money of the Kingsman gentleman and then there's also the new money upper class represented by Sam Jackson and it's a combination of those upper class entities that are our villains so I guess we're just supposed to hate rich people I mean the ultimate scheme is to cull humanity's population by making everyone kill each other while all the hoity-toity receding chin types have just by virtue of being wealthy secured places in Sam Jackson's cool villains base to party it up while all the devastation takes place. This culminates in the scene where the bad guys of course lose and we see all the rich people's heads blow up in a strange Busby Berkeley style sequence. This I think, is supposed to be a cathartic sight for us plebs in the audience. This is supposed to be something that we will relish, seeing this 1% of the population explode in colourful fire and smoke, but I suppose I actually find that kind of patronising. Especially when this is a film coming to us from rich and powerful people. I mean, not that I'm saying that I want Kingsman to be a Ken Loach-style exploration of class, I just don't know why the film includes these themes, but doesn't seem to come down on either side. I don't know whether it's advocating anarchy or establishment or, or what, but I just come away with the message of, well, the working class are going to beat me up or the upper class are going to have me beaten up, so I guess I'll just stay in my nice little middle class bubble. Now, there are mentions of characters in the film who refuse to be a part of Valentine's evil scheme. The only one we really spend any time with, though, is a Swedish princess, so it's trying to have its cake and eat it too by saying like, oh, well, not all well-bred poshos are like this, but at the same time, we are supposed to be savouring seeing these people with money and power die because, um, screw you, Obama. So that feels kind of patronising to me, but then so does the film's representation of the working class, which is just the most stereotypical thing. I mean, everyone talks like an East End gangster 
character, and aside from Eggsy, I think pretty much everyone is contemptible. He has a couple of friends who kind of disappear from the film, but even when they're in it, like, one of Eggsy's character traits is that he cares about defenseless things, and his little sister, and animals specifically, and at one point he is caught by the police because he chooses not to run over a fox. And what is his friend's reaction to this? Foxes are vermin, guys. Should have driven it over. Eggsy's mum is kinda sympathetic, I guess, but she's just so ineffective when it comes to defending her son from these terrible men she's become involved with. It's hard to like her especially, so there aren't really any characters from that side of the class system that are especially likeable besides Eggsy and, you know, by virtue of being a little kid, his little sister. And when we see the shots of everyone, you know, brawling and killing each other, it's not exactly presented in a very horrific way. I mean, except for Eggsy's mum trying to kill the little sister, of course. This is a movie that relishes in showing its violence, much like other Matthew Vaughn films, and, you know, that's to be expected. It's just kind of hard to know what point it's trying to make when it's making these class divides and gleefully relishing and showing you as much violence as possible for one end of the spectrum, but actually holds back on showing, you know, the heads exploding. It's not a realistic blood and brain sort of thing. It's done in a very cartoony way, and I, I don't know if that was like a rating thing. I mean, I, I was expecting something more along the lines of like, you know, Scanner's head exploding, but the cartoony, colourful way it's done is just weird. Cartoony is also a word I'd use to describe much of the action in the film. There's a good amount of action throughout and some great fight scenes, but how some of them are filled and the effects, like, the effects work looks so rubbery and unrealistic that it kind of takes me out of it for a bit. There's a scene in what is ostensibly the Westboro Baptist Church, and Colin Firth is subject to the device that makes everyone want to kill each other. Obviously, this had to be something like the Westboro Baptist Church, because if Colin Firth's character was killing potentially very nice, pleasant people, we wouldn't have liked his character anymore. He had to be killing the most reprehensible, horrible people on the planet for us to still like him. And the scene does provide, like, uh, probably my favourite bit of dialogue in the whole film. I'm a Catholic whore, currently enjoying Congress, out of wedlock with my black Jewish boyfriend who works in a military abortion clinic. So hail Satan, and have a lovely afternoon, madam. But when all the action kicks off, all we're missing is the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote making an appearance. It's also really noticeable in a sequence towards the end where Eggsy is running through a base fighting off bad guys that they have like, I don't know, one like 20 meter tunnel that they are running through again and again and again and again to try and make it seem like the set is much bigger than it is. And you know what, I probably shouldn't dog on the movie too much for this. It certainly doesn't have the budget of a Bond film and it's trying its best to make do with what it has, and while some fight scenes are very cartoony, they are nonetheless super entertaining. I mean, the brawl in the pub being an absolute highlight of the film for me. Indeed, I do pretty much love all the stuff involving Colin Firth's character and his investigating Samuel Jackson. The two characters have a dinner together, which is just fantastic. I'll have the Big Mac, please. Great joy, but nothing beats two cheeseburgers with secret sauce. Goes great with this 45 Lafitte. I just wish that the movie was more about Eggsy and Galahad investigating the villain together, because for much of the film, Eggsy is in, like, spy Hogwarts going through a bunch of trials and training, and in the behind-the-scenes stuff, writer Mark Miller says that this movie was very much a response to Casino Royale, which he describes as such in the behind-the-scenes stuff on the Blu-ray. We were just chatting about Casino Royale, and we were both saying it was a great movie and everything, but it was weird for an origin movie that it didn't quite give you Bond's origin. It'd been great to see Bond training and everything. And Matthew and I were just chatting about this and we were saying, yeah, that'd be really cool, you know? Which I agree with to a point, but I think the origin we witness in Casino Royale is deeper than just Bond goes to spy school, but it, I mean, it's more of a character origin story and how a blunt instrument is refined by the mistakes that he makes and the characters he meets. I'm really glad that Casino Royale didn't go to a teenage Bond learning the ropes and all the stuff with Eggsy at the X-Mansion really turns me off. I would have much rather he learned the ropes while on the job with Colin Firth instead of effectively having to go to boarding school. And then some of the tasks that Eggsy has to take a part in are really confusing and hypocritical. Like, the final task is that the remaining recruits are told they have to shoot the dogs that they've had to care for throughout the whole process. Eggsy is like, well, no, I'm not killing an innocent dog, you psychopath, and therefore does not pass the training, and he's expelled. His fellow student, Roxy, played by Sophie Cookson, does, but the dog lives because the guns were filled with blanks rather than real bullets. Uh, the moral of the lesson being... Limits must be tested. A Kingsman only condones the risking of a life to save another. Which makes absolutely no sense at all, because if a Kingsman would never have to take an innocent life, then... 
Why do you pass the person who would take an innocent life if that's never actually gonna be an order or an option? It all just feels a bit perfunctory to me. I could have bought Eggsy just going along with Galahad and learning on the job as an apprentice rather than gaining his diploma and then being allowed out. Of course, he doesn't pass the training and he goes on to be a Kingsman regardless. One vital element from the Bond formula that the film is curiously missing, funnily enough, is sex. The film seems more concerned with ogling the consumer products it has on show in the form of the tech and the suits. I mean, there aren't many women in the film overall, but Gazelle and Roxy's relationships with the men around them are totally chaste, and while Eggsy does get a girl in the end, it's a very prolonged gag. Sorry, love. You've got to save the world. If you save the world, we can do it in the asshole. I'll be right back. So that's a laugh out loud moment. I think that's really funny, but then there's a really drawn out sequence at the end where we follow Eggsy going back and the camera lovingly pans down to the princess's ass and we get Mark Strong's reaction and then that's the end of the movie. The film is obviously much more violent and crude than a Bond movie ever would be and I, I think that's to the film's credit. I think it knows exactly who its audience is and how to appeal to that audience and despite my love of the cast and the action and the villains and the story, the main thing that I rub up against is just how ugly the Kingsman world is. When you strip it all back, I'm not entirely sure what Eggsy is fighting for and what motivates him aside from like his little sister, I guess. I mean, he doesn't want his sister to be killed and okay, that's a reasonable enough motivation, but the movie version of Bond is very much about queen and country and establishment. This film kind of shines a light on the pomposity of all of that stuff, but I don't know if it really provides anything else that's worth fighting for. It kind of presents as like, if you're poor or rich, you're probably contemptible in some way, and we're really gonna savor watching you be maimed and die because that's what we want for our entertainment, but I don't know what we want to save, except the baby, the dog, and the fox. And maybe that's enough, and maybe that's fine, and maybe I'm just really overthinking it, and I'm just brain farting and making you all listen to it, but I'm really curious to know what you guys think about this one, so please do leave me some comments in the comment section below. I think we could have some really good discussion about this, and I'm really kind of wanting to, yeah, keep formulating some opinions about this particular film, even though I've seen it like five, six times at this point. But I would hate to end this review on any note besides the one that says that, you know, Kingsman is such a bloody good romp of a film. I've seen this film about four or five times now, and I'm never not entertained. It's an interesting look at what the Bond series might have been had they not pursued a different tone with Craig. In places, it feels like a lovingly crafted letter to some of my favorite films and is highly recommended on that basis. But as I say, please do leave me a comment in the comment section below, and please, of course, head over to my other social media pages. I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also go to my Patreon page if you would like to find out how you can be a part of deciding uh, what these non-Bond spy movie reviews that I look at every month are. And until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.